Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Councillor Bridget Petty. I'm the Green Party Councillor for Backwell, and I'm also Executive Member for the Climate Emergency and the Environment. We're delighted that you've joined us this morning. Um, and if you'd like to submit questions, then you can do that via slido.com using hashtag NSCClimate. So that was N for North, S for Somerset, C for Council, Climate. And you can issue questions on there, and we'll try to respond to them after uh, Nicola Webb has provided her update a presentation. I wanted to provide a little introduction, um, and so to say, there's so much we um, need to do in response to the climate crisis that we all face. But I'm pleased today to be able to present the data on the emissions currently coming from North Somerset Council and also the area. I consider this an important first step. We are listening to the science and we are needing to respond to that. Recently, I was listening to a Radio 4 program, Costing the Earth, and I couldn't help agreeing with the comment and the sentiment made that we are the generation now who have the biggest role to play and that we cannot wait. And what we know today about our behaviours is, is more than we knew in the past. So today we all need to make an impact and we all need to respond to the information we have because whatever we do now will have a significant impact for a very long time ahead of us. So I think that it's really important that we all work collaboratively together and I understand that the council needs to work together with other councils like towns and parishes. We need to work with stakeholder groups and we need to bring the residents along with us. We have partners in um, public health, in the NHS, and in many other, and in the businesses. And I'm looking forward to establishing strong relationships to address and identify what actions we can all take together. Although COVID has impacted the way we meet face to face, it has also unlocked many main ways that we can communicate. And in some cases, it's made events like this more accessible. I'm impressed with how everybody has adapted to this changing landscape, and I believe that this shows that it can be done. Without further ado, I'll pass this over to uh, Nicola Webb. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicola Webb. I'm the Climate Emergency Project Manager for North Somerset Council. Um, I'm here today to present some initial work on the climate emergency or the North Somerset area and council own emissions. So we're not here today to explain all about climate breakdown, climate emergency, but I will give a brief explanation of the background of why this is being treated as an emergency um, before we move on to the actions being taken by the council. Um, so the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. Um, and why are we calling it an, an emergency now? The science is clear. The, globally, we were first warned of the effects of, of our increasing greenhouse gas emissions over 30 years ago. And since then, global emissions have continued to increase um, at an exponential rate, and global temperatures have increased with them. In the last three years, we have increasingly had uh, severe warnings from scientists about existential threat to humanity and mass extinction events. People who care about climate breakdown are not just trying to save animals, they're trying to save humanity and life as we know it. So North Somerset, along with hundreds of other local authorities and the UK government, have declared a climate emergency. The UK government will, over the next six months or so, be publishing ambitious climate change policies in order to demonstrate leadership when the world's leaders meet in Glasgow at the Conference of the Parties next year. Um, and why do we want to do it by 2030? Um, under the Paris Agreement, the 2050 deadline to achieve net zero emissions is a global target, and this applies to all signatories, but it allows more time for developing and newly industrial countries, in industrialised countries. That means that countries such as Britain, with long history of, li of higher emissions, will need to decarbonise more quickly. And recognising this, most, many local authorities and other organisations have set a target to reach net zero by 2030. As the country who was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution and one who now imports rather than produces a large amount of goods, we should be able to do this much faster than other countries. Um, I'm not sure that you'll be able to see the detail on this slide very well, but really it's just here as a, 
um, as a visual reminder, a brief reminder for us all of the impacts of climate breakdown and how much damage they could cause. This is the UK Risk Register, published in 2017, and it highlights that pandemic influenza had already been identified as the highest risk to UK well before COVID-19 hit, but climate-related risks, which are the orange circles on here, are also very prevalent, and other risks on this list are also linked with climate change effects or causes. In North Somerset, we're particularly vulnerable to coastal and inland flooding, but the last few years have shown that extreme heat and drought and storms are becoming increasingly severe. So we do see some opposing views in response to the climate emergency since COVID-19 crisis began. Some who feel this shows what a real crisis looks like and why we should worry about something as unimportant as the environment when people are dying but also a huge number of voices asking why we haven't been treating climate emergency, the climate change as an emergency in the same way we have the pandemic. Um, the truth is that it's still just as important as it was before this current crisis, and the effects are still just as, in, as serious. If anything, the pandemic has highlighted the many inequalities people face when it comes to crises, and it's given us some insights and opportunities into what the world could be like. During the lockdown, in, like many previous economic crises, we've seen a dramatic drop in greenhouse gas emissions and an improvement in air quality. And anecdotally, some people have reported observing a fight back in nature. As in previous economic crises, this improvement is likely to only be temporary. And usually when emissions bounce back, they bounce back higher. So we want to try and avoid this, to lock in the positives that we've seen and support people and communities to find a new, lower carbon, more nature-focused normal. But as a result of coronavirus, the world has changed. Social distancing is the new normal, and it's the way that we live, and the way that we live and work and travel is changing. And as a result of that, we're having to make sure that strategies we make and actions we take at the council will respond to that. And they aren't aimed at the world that we knew before. Some things, for example, improvements to public transport, won't have the same impact that they might have done before. So, a brief uh, download or uh, explanation of the last year. It's been a busy year. Um, since the new administration took over, there needed to be considerable change at the council, and environmental issues have become a much higher priority. People are having to rethink the way that they do their jobs in order to take this into account. And the new corporate plan set out some of these changes, becoming an open, fairer, greener North Somerset. The strategy and action plan are working documents. They are, they're being updated as we learn more, and we hope to publish a more live versions of these um, and of progress monitoring later in the year. I started here at the end of February and have taken over the management of the strategy and action plan. One of the first actions for me to, is to, has been to produce some baseline figures to understand our starting point, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. So we've had two baseline inventories produced, um, and this is one of the first jobs, is to, is to understand uh, emissions before we can reduce them. So you can't manage what you can't measure. And that doesn't mean that nothing else can happen during that time, but understanding where we're starting from helps us to prioritise action and to track progress. Doing this exercise has also helped us to set out the boundaries of our targets, which emissions we are directly responsible for, which we can try to influence and support through council policies, and which we need to be asking national government for more support with. These two inventories have been produced, and documents which explain them have been published on our website. And the next few slides, slides give a brief summary of what they show. As a brief reminder, these are the key principles within our climate emergency strategy. Number one, although these are, are not in priority order, is becoming a net zero council. So that's our own estate and our own activities as a council. In terms of overall emissions in the area, this won't make a huge impact. It's only about 1% of North Somerset emissions. But it is important, as it's something that we should have direct control over, and through our, um, through our purchases and decisions and policies, and because we need to be leading by example, walking the walk, and supporting others to do the same. And of course, many of the policies that we put in place for the Council's own activities will then support people in the community to reduce their own as well. We've produced a council emissions report based on government guidance on measuring and reporting environmental impacts of businesses, uh, sorry, of, of, in, 
<laughs> measuring and reporting environmental businesses, uh, impact of businesses. And this is the first time that's been done since about 2010. And I believe it's still in a, wor a work in process, in progress. This is something that inventories always are. Each year we aim to improve the coverage of our emissions report to include more detail from suppliers, contractors and other activities which have been tough to collect this year, um, especially this year. So a brief explanation of what's in this graph. I don't know whether you'll be able to see it very well from home, so I apologise if the writing is very small. Um, so we have scopes one, two and three when we look at organisation emissions. The scope one is direct emissions from fuel combustion and company-owned vehicles. Scope two is emissions uh, associated with the purchase of electricity from our own use. And scope three is indirect emissions. It includes the production of purchased materials, product use, outsourced activities, and contractor-owned vehicles, waste disposal, employee business travel. Um, so I've shown the full scope of the calculated footprint here, and it comes to just under 14,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. So CO2 equivalent includes carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, although our net zero target for the council only includes our scope one and two emissions, we aim to reduce scope three emissions, which are those associated with things that we buy as well, but they're not directly in our target. However, what's in, um, what is and in, isn't in this footprint target is somewhat of a, a moot point. Um, so most of these scope three emissions, you'll notice there's buildings, which is um, academies mostly, uh, business travel, outsourced activities, and employee commuting in here. A vast amount of those emissions are within the area of North Somerset, so they will fall within the area target anyway. But excluding them from the uh, scope one and two target makes my accounting job easier. So the, uh, the decarbonisation bit is difficult, whatever happens. So a little bit of information about how things have changed at North Somerset. Um, our baseline year that we've set is 2018-19 financial year. So we already have two fi full financial years to compare. Since the base year, we have reduced our emissions significantly, although this is through purchasing green electricity. This isn't really enough, and we know this, um, and there are always arguments about how green green tariffs actually are. So we are also planning to increase our renewable energy generation and not to further increase our electricity generation despite um, increasing electric vehicles and potentially electric heating. We've also seen a decrease in gas consumption over that time, and that's partly due to a warmer winter in 2019-20, but also due to improved heating controls within our office buildings. And those are set to be improved further in the coming year. This, uh, on the right-hand side here, you'll see a list of improvements which are already planned. And these are more to do with physical improvements in this list. Um, and in addition to this, we're making improvements to our day-to-day -day working lives. Um, the climate emergency featured prominently in the new corporate plan published earlier this year, and each team is incorporating it into their annual team plans. And we're also rolling out a carbon literacy training uh, program later in the year. Policies such as those around procurement and council decisions making will, or, are also being updated. Um, so in case you can't read the, the signs on the right-hand side, we've got um, energy efficiency, audits and improvements in our buildings, increasing the electric vehicle fleet, uh, street light LED conversion, rewilding, carbon literacy training, policy reviews and home working. So here we have the area emissions. There are a couple of uh, emissions inventories which are, made are ready-made and available for UK local authorities, but neither of them did exactly what we wanted. The uh, Department of Business, Energy in and Industrial Strategy data set gives CO2 only for all years from 20, uh, 2005 to 2018, and we felt that we wanted to ensure that we didn't miss anything important by doing only CO2. So, namely, that's waste and agriculture, which mainly emit methane and nitrous oxide. They are in less significant quantities than CO2, but more powerful. Um, there's also the scatter tool, which gives all gases, but for one year only, and in addition to some forward projections. Uh, one year only means that ignoring previous trends, which are incredibly useful for understanding the whole picture, and some of the assumptions in giving more, a more complete picture are a little simplistic. So we wanted to create our own, uh, based on the underlying data from both of those data sets. So it's very similar. 
Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure it's given us a, a dramatically different picture, um, but I guess it's, it's reassuring to understand that we have a more complete picture. Um, we can see from this chart that transport is by far our biggest sector. So note that we're dealing here in kilotons, so that's thousands of tons, um, compared with the tons in the previous uh, slides. It makes it much easier to, to deal with on the slides doing it that way. So 42% uh, is transport, um, is ma and that's mainly road transport. There's a very small amount, less than 1%, which is rail. Um, and also to note that not included in here is emissions associated with electric vehicles. So they will be included where the vehicles are charged. So domestic if at home, non-domestic if at work, um, or public, trans uh, public charging. Domestic and non-domestic are relatively equal. They're about, both about 25% of emissions. Um, and these are mostly related to buildings, heating and lighting, although some will be associated with mobile machinery. These char charts show that transport is our biggest sector. It's also the sector which has changed the least over time. Um, emissions in buildings are coming down due to improvements in efficiency and decarbonisation of the electricity grid. Um, road transport efficiency is also improving, but this is generally outweighed by an increase in mileage. Compared with other local authorities, we are relatively similar in terms of per capita emissions. Um, variations are due to, due to generally due to relative rurality and whether you have a motorway running through the middle of your authority. Um, it's not completely clear from this chart how much each se sector changes over time. Um, so for reference, emissions from North Somerset as a whole are coming down on average by about 19 kilotons per year. Um, emissions in the domestic se sector decreased by about 11 tons, uh, non-domestic by nine, and transport has actually increased by an average of one kiloton per year over this time scale. Um, you can see it a bit clearly on these next slides. So this is how dramatic the change is <laughs> that we need to make. In terms of emissions, it is fairly dramatic. We need to go from the graph on the left uh, which is where we're heading, a very simple extension of current trends, um, not including things like new housing, additional cars, things like that, um, to the graph on the right. So that change needs to be transformative. It can't be small and incremental. Our annual additions need, to, uh, sorry, annual reductions need to be changing from about 19 kilotons per year which is mostly due to changes outside of our control, to closer to 120 kilotons per year, which is the equivalent of taking 50,000 cars off the road every year. And actually, it might be more dramatic than this still, because we haven't seen what's happened uh, in 2019 yet. Um, we're already into 2020, so we need to be making sure that we are making up for anything that hasn't happened already. Um, just quickly to go over this, the UK government has a carbon budget approach to ensuring that we don't go over our, a fair share of emissions. So when we're thinking about the effects of emissions from climate, what matters is the total amount of greenhouse gases that we emit. So if we carry on emitting at full capacity until 2030 and then switch everything off, we meet our 2030 target, but we've emitted well over our fair share. So this is an illustration about how carbon budgets could be applied to North Somerset using an approach developed by the Tyndall Centre at Manchester University. If we compare that with a straight line from now to 2030, it's actually fairly similar, for, certainly for the first few years. In reality, it's unlikely that we'll go as steeply as that in 2019, but we'll see. Um, so lots of these comparisons as checks will be important as we go along to ensure that we stay on target. Um, and going to net zero by 2030 will keep us to well within our fair share of emissions. So that is actually the full summary now of the uh, two documents that have been published on our website. So what next? Um, as originally laid out, the strategy and action plan are working documents. The aim is to keep updating them as we learn more about our situation about what our priorities are, what our powers are, and what the barriers are to change. And we're also keeping an eye on national policy and working together with other local authorities in the area to ensure that we optimise opportunities where we can. 
The next public update is now likely to be to come in the autumn, slightly delayed due to COVID. And we're aiming to have more concrete actions and methods for monitoring progress published on our website by then. Monitoring will be based on our current situation, for example, number of cars per day, and an assessment of what is needed, sorry, number of car journeys per day, and an assessment of what is needed to make this change. Um, coronavirus has had an interesting effect. In many ways, it has interrupted everyday work and slowed things down. My first few months in this job have not gone exactly the way that I had expected. However, we are seeing some dramatic changes to our day-to-day -day lives. At least some of those will hopefully stick. Um, so post-coronavirus, there are, or now, from now onwards, there are lots of changes happening. So we're mostly working from home at the council, and I'm sure in many other companies as well. Um, you'll have noticed some road changes around the area, and we're hoping to rebuild the economy in a greener and fairer way. Um, I've put a bullet point up here as well about engaging with town and parish councils and other stakeholders. So we'll be doing more things like this, hopefully, um, updating the website as well so that more people can see what they can do themselves. Um, and generally speaking, as Bridget Petty said earlier, talking uh, to as many stakeholders as we can. Um, so I think that is all that we are going to talk about now, and we can move over to questions. Hi. Um, so assuming that I'm now back on the screen, I think. Um, thank you very much, Nikki. I think that that's a really helpful insight. And I think understanding that uh, 1,400 kilotons of greenhouse gas emissions are coming out of our area at present or from the data in 2018 um, is, is kind of giving us the, the really good facts. We are all com committed to reducing the emissions that we're producing, and as we've seen, road transport, domestic emissions, and commercial emissions all need to be part of that, because those are our big, significant ones at present. We need to make bold statements, such as the need to remove cars from the roads to meet these ambitious targets, and this change will only happen with the commitment and work of, of cross-party and also of working with our residents and with our stakeholder groups. Uh, Nikki has raised what some of the uh, uh, tools we've been using, but we've also been using Facebook Live um, effectively through COVID. Uh, the executive have been available to answer questions and we'll continue to, uh, to do events like that. I'm going to turn over to questions right now. Uh, Rob has asked whether we could bring up the, the first slide, I think, which had scope one, two, and three. And I think that will be referring to the North Somerset um, emissions. And perhaps we'll just bring that up again and from there, maybe Nikki, can you just do a little bit more talking about, so that is, can you just bring, talk through that again a little bit? Apologies. Um, so scope one, which is the blue section, um, is split into buildings and own transport. So the own transport section um, is actually quite a lot of that is the refuse collection trucks. Um, scope two um, is split again into buildings and then also street lights, road signs and fountains. So scope two is the electricity that we use um, within the council. These ones as well, in, in this large graph, um, we've used the national carbon intensity factor of the national grid rather than removing emissions um, due to using a green uh, tariff. It just helps us to see the total emissions and, and, and to get a, a bigger picture of the full impact. Um, and then scope three on the right-hand side, the, the grey, um, so there's a quite a large amount of that, it's just over 50%, which is buildings, so that is actually emissions from academies. Um, and then business travel is the next largest slice of that. Uh, and that will be travelling to meetings, so I assume this year that will be very low. Um, and then the next one around, we have outsource activities, so that is road building um, and a few other uh, uh, road building and cl uh, cleansing and things like that. And then we've got employee commuting at the bottom, so that's a relatively small chunk, um, but it is something that we are hoping to be able to help with. Thanks. I, I'd spotted, sorry, Rob had a follow-up related, which was, can you estimate how much emissions reduction we can make due to not travelling to work, or is it impossible to gauge? 
Oh, I can. Um, I don't have the numbers exactly on me, but it is that small chunk right at the bottom, if you can see it. So it's not a big one. Um, maybe 5 or 10% of that 14,000 tonnes. Great, that's helpful. And I have a question from Stuart. Uh, where does the ability of planning policy to influence the emissions of developments fit into the scopes? Ah, okay. So in the scopes here, it won't fit in enormously. Um, so that's really when we get onto the area emissions. Uh, so at the moment, the, the blue chunk that I'd, hopefully you can see my slides here, um, the blue chunk here is domestic emissions. Um, so at the moment, obviously we have all of these emissions which we need to get down to zero, but we will also be building new homes. Um, I suppose non-domestic as well would be planning, uh, planning policy. Um, so we need to ensure that the new buildings that we build are as close to net zero as we can. However, there is... Um, quite a lot of planning policy that comes down from national government. And defining exactly what we can do and what we can't do um, is a work in progress, I would say. Um, yes, I think that's helpful. So uh, Nicola Webb and the team um, also work with the planning team and they look at what policies we can develop and then um, the elected members and councillors have a role to play in uh, lobbying and, and discussing with government how the national policies are shaped to address the climate emergency and, and the Climate Change Act and, and liaising upwards uh, to, to promote and push government to establish stronger policies. At the same time, it's also the councillor's responsibility to ensure that the policies in place are um, meeting the objectives of those councillors and, and the organisation now. So the local plan is something that will be developed in the coming years and that is an important document that can be used to push and encourage um, development, future developments to consider their role in uh, the climate emergency and I think that it's interesting because it's not just the domestic but it's also the non-domestic because of course developments might be commercial developments. Um, I think as well we need to consider the transport um, so when we're developing the local plan we're not just looking at what sort of buildings we build but where we build them so it's very important that um, that we are building uh, developments which are self-contained so people don't have to travel as much but where they do travel they are close to existing travel links and there's good cycle routes um, it's very important so because transport is already such a large uh, sector for us. We want to make sure that we're not adding to that and that we are making things, making alternatives to the road transport. And carrying on that, I've seen interesting research recently around um, coming out and positions coming out about communities and 15 minute communities. So, so how you can have rural hubs or urban hubs, but where your services, many of your services might be within 15 minutes of your house and that's walking, cycling. So if we picture a future, and we do need to work towards picturing this future that we live in, which is not what it looks like today, and that is the way that we can get to a, a world where we are able to take 50,000 cars off the road every year, um, where people can access those services at a short distance. I know that's a long way to, to move to, but that's the kind of planning do documents, and that planning process is really key to addressing some of these ambitions, um, and they, they have a really important role to play, uh, and the council will be looking at those documents, so it's good timely that we try to be... Um, ambitious with the designs and the work that we put into those documents. I'll go back to the Slido list now. So one is, do we anticipate an increase in the need for electricity in the area? Do you mind commenting on that, Nikki? Um, yes, so although many household appliances and lighting is becoming more efficient, we are also expecting uh, more electric vehicles and more uh, heating to be done using electricity. So yes, it is likely that electric, electricity consumption will go up um, and we are working with uh, the distribution grid to, um, to, work, to make sure that there is enough electricity to go around in the area. Great. And how does the tourism sector fit into these calculations? Are we taking on emissions produced as, as trips, uh, trip origins from outside the North Somerset area? Um, no. So we actually, in, in here, the transport is only included within the area of, of North Somerset. 
Um, I think it would be a very interesting exercise to do to understand the difference um, or understand the emissions associated with travelling to Western Supermare or Clevedon or somewhere. Um, however, I sometimes feel like we need to understand the greater good of those emissions. I would rather people were driving here than flying to Spain. Um, but exactly how you make that decision of, of what's best is, is difficult. Yeah, and echoing uh, those comments, I've recently seen information about the the economic benefits of the tourism community, but also the job creation that we have in North Somerset around our tourism offer. Uh, this administration is certainly keen to promote and increase the profile of North Somerset as a whole, Cleved and Portishead, of course, Western Super Mare, um, as, as a destination to visit. And absolutely, if we can encourage people to have staycations, visit North Somerset, don't bother staying on the motorway all the way to Devon and Cornwall, and of course do that instead of uh, visiting places via using the um, aeroplanes, which we know has significant emissions, then they'll be spending money and keeping money in the economy locally. I think that it's really interesting. We, I attended a really good talk and had some speakers from Weston about what sustainable tourism can look like, um, and I do think there's a really big market offer there, so I'm really excited to explore that further. I see a question from Alan. Any plan for plans for green jobs? For instance, retrofitting poorly insulated private rented flats um, and, and others in the sector. So for this one, at the moment, we're really uh, waiting for the latest bit of government guidance to come out or government uh, policy. Um, you'll have seen on the news that there is a, a voucher scheme that the government is putting out to uh, homeowners, which will be about £5,000 for homeowners to spend on retrofitting of their homes. It wouldn't be enough for a full retrofit, um, but it certainly would help more than we've had so far. We are hoping to um, get involved as much as possible to ensure that the voucher scheme um, works well for people in the area and also that we can if we can support anyone in any way to understand how to do it then that'd be good yeah again echoing but without wanting to repeat I'm certainly keen to see us as an organization lobby that that offering and that grant is done in the most effective and supportive way to support local businesses uh, job creation as, as is mentioned and I think that so the, the council is doing some really excellent work right now about economic regeneration what next and it really is putting the build back better uh, the green new deal that kind of aspect of green jobs, digital jobs, thinking differently at the heart of what uh, we believe North Somerset can look like in the future. We're going to work closely with our education providers, um, the North Somerset Enterprise Agency and other aspects to look at how job creation and retrofitting can be part of that. We have an excellent housing team who have been looking at the money available in the past and there has been grant money to support uh, properties getting better environmental standards, so improving EPCs and that's certainly worth getting in touch with me about to find out more information um, and I can pass you on to the right people so if anybody is a property owner who owns private rental properties I'm certainly happy to link people up I'll look at the next question are we looking at gas emissions what about the use of plastic PPE being a big problem I feel like there's two different questions there so how about let's take are we looking at gas emissions um, what about plastic and PPE? I think that I'm just going to comment on PPE. It's really challenging. Of course, we're in a situation where COVID has meant that people need to behave differently. We need to manage this pandemic and try to reduce the impact and, and reduce you know, illness impacting people and, and obviously prevent death. So PPE is an important part of that. Um, I hope it can be disposed of safely. I hope it can be disposed of into appropriate... Um, bins and rubbish cycling not all of these things are recyclable but it but what's worse is when we hear about it ending up on the beach um and in our natural environment so i was on itv news last night actually commenting on how much of a problem that was becoming so again we're pushing messages on managing our waste properly but i'll pass over to nikki to talk about gas thank you um and also on the ppe when it's a uh, personal um not professional PPE, so when I'm on the bus, I need to wear a face mask. We can be using renewable, um, washable face masks. I think that's very important as well. Um, so yes, gas is included. I don't know how well you can see in these um, 
pie charts. So in domestic and in non-domestic, there is a slot in here, which is gas. Um, and actually, these emissions include uh, the upstream emissions as well. So from extraction, of uh, extraction and distribution of gas is included within those emissions. Great, thank you. Um, is North Somerset actively encouraging other organisations to sign up to the 2030 target in North Somerset region to create a sense of a shared goal? I think that's a really good question from Stuart, and I think that's something that we really need to work on this year. So that was something I wanted to be doing, and I recognise that the role of us as an organisation, uh, the current administration, has a really key role in working together with external organisations um, COVID put a slight scupper on the stakeholder engagement that I wanted to pursue and actively um, organise this year. It is, it is currently on my list of, of to-dos and I certainly want to um, take that forward. So any organisation who wants to do actively work with us on that, please do come to us. But like Nikki raised, we are going to reach out. We are currently in dialogue with parish and town councils and we want to strengthen that relationship as, as well as working with other organisations. I've been talking to some of the unions, but there are many other organisations I want to be um, working with, so certainly keen to see that happen. Uh, next question is from an anon anonymous source, but is, sorry, is, um, is the airport included in the emissions calculations? And maybe Nikki can talk about some of the work we did and discussed about whether they should and shouldn't be included. Thanks. Okay, so ground-based emissions at the airport are included. Um, they will be included within the non-domestic um, emissions, so their gas, electricity, uh, gas and electricity will be included where their meters are read, and then under other fuels, um, the ground-based um, vehicles will be included within there. We haven't included um, aviation emissions. Um, there's a very long amount of discussion that we can have about that. Um, there are various uh, methods of estimating how many people within an area are taking flights or whether you can distribute it, uh, national flights or Bristol's flights by the population. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but essentially what we want to be able to do is, is measure and monitor this um, accurately as possible um, so I think anything that we did like that would be um, very much modelled and estimated and I'd rather have it have it accurately and I would rather make sure that we are concentrating on the things where we can make improvements so a big part of that will be transport to the airport um, and that's something that I would like to work directly with the airport with if possible yeah so um a year ago when I started in this post, I created a working party where we have other elected uh, councillors coming together from across party, across all of the different parties, and we meet and we discuss uh, the work of the climate emergency work. And so Nikki brought the work that she was doing regarding the inventories and regarding what to include and what not to include. Um, and in there we talked about at Bristol Airport, and we had robust discussions, so there was challenge from both sides, you know, should we take responsibility, should we really make sure that everything is, is counted and every single thing is included? But then there's also the conversation of, um, for one thing, what other areas are counting, and the other is um, how much influence we have over those emissions, and also who is using... Um, those services, those, those airports. So we have lots of people coming from other places in, around the country to, to use that airport. So one of the factors in, in including that. Somebody's also asked, um, how do you decide what is in and out of the inventory, i.e. Uh, motorways and airports? And I feel that's, that's that conversation that we've been having. So I think that it was a, an internal discussion as well as um, so a, a discussion with a number of different councillors, understanding the pros and cons of it, but also um, Nicola's professional insight into how other inventories are, are you know. Are so this was really based on the um, Bayes emissions inventory, which I worked on previous to this, to this job. Um, so we really took what was included in, in that emissions inventory um, and added things that we, that we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing. So agriculture and waste, um, but also methane and nitrous oxide, which, which weren't included in the Bayes inventory. Um, so the, the, there are two versions of that inventory um, that are produced at a national level. Uh, one is, is this, 
the things that, that, were, that were deemed to be within the scope of an, uh, a local authority and, and one which are things that happen within that area but are deemed to be without, outside of the scope. Um, and one of the things that, that is either inside or outside on that is motorways. Um, so in, in that inventory, you can choose whether or not to include motorways. And we had a very long discussion about this. And we felt that um, for North Somerset, the motorway is, is a really important road for us. It's not just people traveling through North Somerset to get to Devon and Cornwall, it's us traveling between Weston and Clevedon and other places. So we do really need to make sure that we have alternatives to using the motorway if we want to be reducing our emissions. And a question from uh, Ben Moss. Um, can North Somerset Council and Planning Departments support and showcase organisation and developments that enable zero carbon lifestyles? I think that's a really interesting question and I certainly would like to continue to work with the Planning Department to uh, think about ways and understand ways that we can do that. I am aware that uh, there currently is, I think it's still open, a consultation about a... Um, a development that is being considered in Nailsey, which is by the uh, architects um, who, the name escapes me, but they were the Sterling Prize winners um, in Nottingham. So they developed some affordable low carbon housing and, we, and the council has made uh, this commitment to work with those architects who are, are highly acclaimed um, to, look at, to look at those specific developments. So I do hope that, that this council can be more bold and more ambitious in some of its um, design plans, development plans, and working with partners to really promote um, really positive examples of low carbon living and the future that we need. Thanks for that question. Uh, we've got an anonymous question. How urgent should we feel about the six-year Tyndall Centre carbon budget identified for North Somerset? Sorry, Nikki, bit of a tricky one. Um, Yes, I think that we should feel fairly urgent about it. Um, that is a difficult one, um, because in general, this, this, is, this is the way that uh, nationally and internationally we should be looking at emissions, in that if we go over that six years of our fair share or our total carbon budget, um, then we are exacerbating the issue of climate change. Um, hopefully, we won't be doing that. <laughs> I think that it will come back to this conversation of how hard we lobby and how we work with national government because I think that national government really has to enable a lot more of if there needs to be change in legislation, there needs to be supportive, appropriate, really it has to be high volumes of cash invested and we need to stop doing some of the things. So it's, it's what you want to start seeing happen and what you want to stop see happening. So it's all very well to invest more in retrofitting our properties, which we certainly need to do but we need to stop some of the things that are really carbon intensive uh, really emission heavy actions that are still on the table from this national government so um, there is a role to play a, co a council has a significant role to play but it is actually always slightly caveated heavily caveated by what national government is doing around us so um, I think that's really key and sometimes it's hard to, it's not always transparent where the line between central government and councils lie, um, but it is an important one and we'll try to be dis demystifying that as much as possible. Did you want to come in again? Um, and, and as I said earlier, there's, there's the Conference of the Party, COP26 in Glasgow next year. It was supposed to be this November, but it's been postponed because of coronavirus. Um, and the national government are, are putting out a lot of policies in the next six months or so um, to really try to put, make us one of the world leaders when we get to COP26. So I know that there's a consultation out at the moment about decarbonising road transport, or mm, decarbonising transport, um, and and that will be published towards the end of this year. I think actually, interestingly, that's something we could do a little bit more of, is using North Somerset Council's social media, and like maybe the account on Facebook, um, to, to, to share when there are consultations that seem relevant to the targets of our climate emergency, um, so that our residents can get, get more actively involved. I think there's... Um, yeah, my brain's gone for what I was going to carry on saying on that. But these are really great questions, so thank you, everybody. I think this is... I'm trying to decide if these are related. No, let me ask these as separate questions. Will more staff working from home, especially in the winter, when more heating and lighting is needed, just transfer the costs and the emissions to the individuals? I know that Nicola's been considering this a lot. 
Yes, I love this question. Um, so there are a, an awful lot of studies going on at the moment about which, which is better. Um, and I think at the moment um, it, it still looks as though uh, working from home from an emissions perspective is better than working in an office. Um, obviously the cost side of things is an issue um, and I, I'm hoping that with government vouchers for retrofitting homes that can go some way towards making sure that our homes are not too costly to heat. Um, I'd also like to see more um, uh, organisations using benefits packages to support individuals with their home working arrangements. And linked to that, I had some really interesting conversations with some of the internal staff last week, um, linked with the HR work, to say that if we, I would like to see the council promoting uh, working remotely, so that would reduce our carbon emissions associated with the travelling, um, and we know that we need to reduce those road transport costs um, and emissions, um, but actually there is a role to play in um, advice and support on energy efficiency and and really there's been some great work from the center for sustainable energy around future proofing and if you google future proof that's a really interesting scheme but i think that that advice is what people are craving that that confidence in which is the right next action to make my home um more efficient so that I can save on money and also uh, reduce my emission personally, like reduce one's emissions. So I think that uh, we as a council have a responsibility to do that and I don't see why that information that we share with our staff couldn't be shared more widely also and I think we have a role to play with sharing that with um, residents of North Somerset. Rob has put in a question, the buses are in dire financial trouble. How do we encourage people to use them again? and even start using them rather than a car. Any initiatives? Uh, <laughs> Rob, I think that this is a really, I'll take that question, but I think it's a really difficult one right now. Um, until it feels like it's safe to do that uh, due to the COVID situation, um, I think it's really challenging. I think we're really fortunate that, fortunate, the weather is still warm. It is dry and it is sunny. So the more people we can encourage to start giving it a go, to, to make their journeys by bicycle, to put their kids in a trailer or a bike seat to show that that's possible, to walk for the 20 minutes or half an hour that they thought they needed the five minute run in the car. So I think that for now, I'm going to say, and also I traveled by train this morning and that felt comfortable. It felt safe for me. I had a mask on the whole time. I didn't try to touch too many things. So I think per personal experience, um, the train is feeling good. I would like to encourage people to, to use the bus if they feel they need to. Um, but yes, it's going to be really interesting to see what initiatives come out. And I think we're going to need significant government support. And... Um, yeah, so I, I'm somebody's come in saying people will always use their cars, young families. I think, uh, and are you considering grants towards electric cars? So the council has been doing some really excellent work, and this ties in, again, coming back to our sustainable transport team, I think they've been doing fantastic work on, um, sometimes on electric cars, but also encouraging people to cycle, encouraging people to walk, and, and making um, available electric bicycles uh, for key workers and for loans. So there's some really great work that's come out of the council on that. I think we need to shout about it more, encourage it more, um, and keep keep kind of offering a wide plethora of alternatives to the traditional car. Thanks, hope that was okay. I'm going to, so we've got, what do you consider are the key challenges for the council in the short and medium term? I'm going to see whether Nikki wants to come in and then I might have a think. So we've got about 10 minutes to go. Uh, if there's one or two more questions, then we're happy to answer them. Um, but I'll see what Nikki has. So one of the key challenges, um, obviously transport is a really big issue for us, um, and at the moment there's a lot of work going on about social distancing and changes to road layouts. Um, and a lot of this, at, at the moment, the immediate um, requirement is social distancing to enable people to step off the curb when they're walking um, or to cycle because it, rather than taking the bus again to, to allow there to be more space for the people that have to take the bus. Um, and, and one of the key challenges is to really um, believe in these policies. So it has been shown um, there's lots of areas in London that have a lot more um, pedestrianised uh, and, and cycling zones that actually uh, 
companies, shops and cafes see more footfall, people spend more time and more money in those locations if they cycle or walk there. Um, so we really need to stay strong on those things and make sure that we, we believe in them and that we try them out. And these uh, policies that are coming down from national government at the moment are allowing us to have these trial periods, which would never have been possible before. So we can um, make a road only open to cars and uh, sorry, only open to bikes and pedestrians. Um, and after a year, We'll see whether people have adapted and we'll see how we get on with that and we'll see whether it is the right way to go. Um, whereas previously it, was, it seems almost impossible that we could do that um, for a temporary period. So I think that's a really uh, key um, uh, issue or key challenge. Another one is planning. Um, so as, as Councillor Petty said earlier, we are working on the, local, the new local plan at the moment. So understanding what things we can put in place, uh, um, what things that we can update in planning policy, um, sustainable uh, planning documents that can be updated in the interim before the local plan is finished. Um, and hoping that we can lobby government as much as possible to to make planning policy uh, greener. Great. I think those are really um, <clears throat> important factors. I think that uh, Nikki's absolutely right in talking about the opportunity we have in front of us around safer walking and cycling opportunities, and that that as being a really bold commitment to reviving our high street, making them safer for everybody, and, and providing that space where people want to come, stay, experience, spend their money to revive our local economy. So I think that the work that the economics team in, in North Somerset is doing around identifying what kind of renewal we want to see taking place in North Somerset and that being a green, um, healthy, inclusive digital. And that's really working with businesses, working with all aspects of our, our economy to see that um, embedded positive next step for, for, for the kind of recovery phase. I think that the work that um, we want to do in-house as well around climate literacy will really strengthen what this council offers because um, it's really important that the climate commitment and the work that we're doing is across all of our, our sectors because the council has so many services that it provides to so many people and when it embeds that knowledge and that understanding we'll see continued um, excellent decision making that is part of this, this recovery and part of those steps in the right direction to um, a North Somerset that has reduced emissions. I think I'm going to take a final question, which is how could the council get electric pool cars within rural villages? I think that's a really excellent question. I live in a village, and I think it's, um, it's a really interesting one that I've been considering for a long time. I'm not sure the exact answer to it, but I think that working together with our towns and parish councils, and there are, they're called city car clubs. There are city car clubs that have been established uh, for a number of years. I've used them in Bristol. I know they work well in cities. So how can we turn that into a viable uh, financial model for some of our rural communities? I think that it's going to be really important that we find ways to work together. And, um, and I believe that there are many groups, towns and parish councils who are ready to make bold commitments and work on really ambitious, um, ambitious plans and actions towards, towards making North Somerset um, a really brighter future for everybody. So thank you everyone for coming today and tuning in. Um, thank you for engaging with us. My email address is bridget.petty at n-somerset.gov.uk. I'm also on social media. We have North Somerset Council on social media. We have North Somerset Life. So do follow us, do keep in touch with us, Twitter, uh, Facebook, not sure if we're on Instagram and others yet. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to coming back and having that open dialogue with you again and providing an update in, uh, in the autumn. Thank you very much.